welcome to this session on regen dairy grazing specifically about dairy um, we all kind of probably feel like we know a bit about how to do it in beef and sheep but it's a bit more difficult or not difficult but different different for dairy it's not just a case of taking beef and applying it to dairy we all know that we need to make sure that um, we are taking account of the different type of system the different type of cows uh, the different product and the um, the the, the the essential element of yield um, in, in a dairy system. Um, so I'm going to only talk for a minute or two, and then I'm just going to basically let these two great guys talk about what they've been doing and share their experiences. One thing that we wanted to acknowledge as part of this is um, it can get quite confusing, and I'll just reel off. Like We love an acronym in farming, don't we, if ever, if ever we loved acronyms, but um, particularly when we get into regen grazing where we have mob grazing, amp grazing, rotational grazing, holistic plan grazing, and next level grazing, just to name a few. I'm going to introduce our two great farmers now. Um, we've got Debbie, uh, based in Gloucestershire, 900 acres of vital stats. Also, in fact, we love a vital stat, don't we? So 900 acres, 190 milking cows, combination of genetics with Holstein, Brown Swiss, Montbelliard, Progross, um, and finishes all a cattle on farm. Tom... Dorset, Dor uh, Dorset, Devon border, uh, 900 acres, moving up to 1,600 acres this year, um, which in part will allow the finishing wool cattle on farm. And they are uh, Tom and his wife Sophie working with Irish Frisians. Both of them are part of the Arla Regen Pilot Farm Network. That's another big mouthful to get your head around. Um, where Arla, um, uh, the, the way that they're engaging with the regenerative movement and working out what it's going to take to, to transition dairy farms is a pilot network, 25 farms across Europe um, in all the countries that they operate. And the, the project came about because about three years ago, um, Arla were like, yeah, we want to do regen. What, what do they came and said, what, what, what should we do? What do we tell everyone to do? And of course, we're like, well, we don't actually have the answer to that. You're going to have to find it out. Yes, there are some examples in the States. We're all familiar with those and the videos that come with them. But um, what do we say in regenerative farming? It's all about context. And so that wasn't relevant um, for our context. So it's like, we're going to have to figure this out. So we'll find some willing farmers and we'll, we'll work with them and, and figure out what it looks like for European dairy. So um, both Tom and Debbie are part of that project, but also they're part of the um, Innovative Farmers, the Soil Association um, initiative on, um, on, on regenerative grazing on their farm. So they're both involved in that project as well. So it's great to have them um, come and talk about what, what, what they're doing. So I'm just going to get going um, and put the question to Tom first. Really simply, Tom, why regen grazing? And what outcomes are you looking for? It's, it's, a, it's a simple question, but maybe quite a big one. <laughs> um, why regen grazing for us would probably go back three or four years, maybe even a bit further, when we started questioning, is what we're doing right? Are the reasons we're doing what we're doing right? And are we actually, you know, are we doing the right things? So what we were finding, we're, we're organic, um, grass-based system. And I'm, I'm following what I've been taught we're doing five to seven year lays, uh, red clover, white clover, perennial ryegrass, uh, full plow reseed, maybe a break crop, a uh, whole crop in between. Um, but actually we're not really seeing any increase in production. We've been growing seven and a half to eight tons of dry matter um, per hectare for the last uh, five years. And we're spending all this money. Why aren't we actually producing more grass year on year? Um, and what we were seeing was our new lays were growing 10 ton, but actually by the time we um, we rip them up, they're only growing five ton. The mean of that is seven and a half ton. So if we carry on with the system, we're continually gonna grow seven and a half ton. We've been at the farm five or six years by this point, and we're starting to get uh, our second set of um, soil samples back, at which point the soil scientist or fertilizer salesman is telling me to put more lime on and more slag on and and turn over some more fields and i'm starting to question why we we keep doing the same things over and over again i'm being told plowing is the answer for docks and i'm looking at every organic farm in the southwest covered in docks and they've been plowing for 30 years so is this really the answer um, on those second set of samples you know we're organic dairy farmers which is supposed to be you know pretty good for soil health and we were seeing reductions in soil indices 
So if we're already seeing reductions in soil indices after four or five years of farming, what's going to happen if we just carry on on this system that we're doing? Like we're properly extensive. We're not. We don't have huge amounts of ghost acres. We're not feeding much concentrate, buying in much straw or anything like this. So you know we need to be careful. This is when we started thinking, what is it that we could do to improve soil health and grow more pasture? If we can grow more pasture, we can we can make more money. Um, perfect. And Debbie, why regen grazing and what are you looking to change? So I pr probably come from a different perspective to Tom. So we, it was more kind of learning about regen and starting with the young stock and working out what I could do grazing them, and then looking at our cows that we haven't, we don't do reseeds. We've always been permanent pasture, and virtually everything the cows graze has not been reseeded in my lifetime, and so we are kind of doing the regen grazing already, but not knowing that we've been doing it um, with the cows. So they always been on fresh grass twice a day but t rather than balancing the grass very well we've been just if we haven't got the grass we give them buffer feed and then the cows get kind of addicted to buffer feed and if they're not happy with the field they just come and stand at the gate and say well there's nice food in the shed so for me the regen grazing is trying to improve the grass and the grazing and getting them to actually utilize what they're eating better out there um, while improving the yeah, the soil health, um, and yeah, more grass, more milk from grass, better without putting fertilisers and things on. Sounds good. How long um, since you started looking at this, Debbie? Um, so I've probably been doing the method we've been doing. This is the second season of properly trying to do it but looking back I've looked back at the records um, from when my father was running the grazing and the only time that I've got uh, like all the plate metering data was 2019 when I bought a plate meter to tell him how to graze and um, I was going around measuring them and saying you know people say three leaf stage and you should be going in at 2800 and coming out at 1500 and you're going in at 4500 and coming out at you know 3,000, 2,500, you're doing it wrong. And he's like, no, that, that's the way I do it. And so I gave up plate metering then. Fortunately, um, we lost him last year, so I've now had to take over the grazing. And I've actually realised he was doing it the right way, and I was trying to tell him to do it the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, practically speaking, Tom, what when you're when we're talking about regen grazing, what does it mean in the context of your system? Like, like how 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 do you do it? So we would have historically we would have been twenty five, twenty eight day round, um, twenty eight hundred to fifteen hundred as close as we could, proper New Zealand style, and that would have been on every stock type: milkers, dry cows, in calf heifers, and yearlings. Um, and we've moved moved away from that. Dry cows are deferred grazing, standing hay. Our twos, the in-calf heifers, would be, um, Soph would have them on, on really tall grass, properly sort of tall grazing, mob grazing, when sort of when we're, when the seasons allow. Um, the R ones, the, the the baby calves, they're grazing grazing high and moving fast to um, keep the calves up, keep them out of the worms, keep the worm burden low, keep them moving to keep the flies away. Um, and the milkers are probably the challenging, the milking cows are the challenging stock type um, to get 100% right. Um, we're, we're increasing, um, we're increasing grazing covers um, but what, what we have is we already have a business and this business has a set amount of land and a set amount of acres and we have a set stocking rate. So we're stocked to graze as we do. So trying to build covers in the spring and hold covers through the summer is quite tricky, especially with the last two years of drought. It makes trialing tall grazing quite hard when you're not growing any grass. Um, and But, you know, theoretically, the the increase in cover and, and in we're seeing it in reality the fields that we're um, we're grazing out this time of year 
the the soil's hotter, the fields are burning out quicker. Um, you know, we're getting less production. But managing managing the milk cows would be the hardest to make sure you get it right between not too advanced that you're losing quality um, and not too low that you're losing grass. Um, one one person that both of you are working with as part of the ALA project is um, Siobhan, um, who has a, an organisation called Next Level Grazing, one of the grazing types we mentioned. And I, I realise I said all the acronyms at the beginning and didn't say... Um, didn't say what they were, but maybe Debbie, do you mind explaining just a little bit about what next level grazing is, or what you're d maybe what you're doing on your farm as far as next level grazing? Yeah, I, I'm not sure that I actually fit into any pigeonhole. I wouldn't say I'm doing any particular thing. I'm doing. It's all about context, and it's what's right for my context. So, the next level grazing, I would say, is having yeah more solar panels. Yeah, especially when you, you know, this is midsummer. You want as much solar panels there to catch as much energy as possible. Um, and Siobhan talks about showing um, farms where, you know, this time of year they've cut everything for silage, they've grazed everything down to nothing, and you've got the maximum potential to be capturing that sun's energy, and you haven't got any solar panels there. Um, and so the idea of trying to um, keep keep that grass growing and keep that solar panel there so that it can keep growing grass grows grass so um i'm maybe not doing siobhan justice you know, it's like two-day course to explain exactly what we did but the idea of um rather than taking say fields out for um for silage or you know cu cutting them is to do um so rather than taking the cows into them you've got too much grass in front of the cows use young stock to kind of really, you know, kind of almost traditionally mob graze, trample that, but with quite a green um, vegetative growth. So you're putting that um, young growth back into the soil and then it will rebound quicker. So compared to cutting it and then you're leaving kind of bare thing, you've, you're fertilising it with that green cover. So you've, some people will say, all right, you're wasting half the grass, but you're not wasting half the grass. That's fertilising it and then you're getting that regrowth back so you can get the cows back around there quicker um and it's yeah trying to leave long go into longer grass and leave longer grass but not go too far that you're getting it senescing and losing quality and it's there very much that balance between not losing that quality so that the cows still milk yeah um just one quick one what would you think is your Rest period then compared to what? What do you think you're kind of working on rest period wise? Yeah, again, change throughout the it's year. context. So it, you know, in a really fast growing time in May, I it could be 15 days rest period. You know, when it's the grass is growing slower and you've got drought, or later on in the year it could be kind of 60 days. So it's going to vary, um, and it's also about looking at the how what the leaf stage is of that growth. So you want to um yeah we're talk talking not going back in until you've got two and a half three leaf stage growth but you want that to be a large amount of grass not three leaves and it's not very much grass yeah so trying to get that balance cool well i think one of the big things that the, that i i personally got is we're trying to do this on rye grass clover lays and i thought you could just go into a 5000 kilo cover and mob graze that and, and it would all work but that's where you lose the quality and what she's saying is you need to you need to build up the the if you're especially if you're on rye grass because it wants to go to head especially in the spring you need to build up um your leaf state so you start grazing it like you would especially in the spring and before before heading date and you need to build soil health and you need to build plant health before you can really start getting up to the heights and and that that was to me was the real light bulb moment to where we were losing quality and we were also seeing that we're trying to knock down these massive covers of ryegrass on fairly knackered soil the soil doesn't have the ability to break down the massive biomass it's all this carbon that you've just laid down on the soil isn't being broken down there's nothing in the soil at this point to break this down so don't get too excited too quickly um and all we found was is we we laid it down and it will sit there and died and rotted and we just grew wheatgrass back. It was what was naturally wanting to grow from the field. We killed everything underneath it. 
So we probably went backwards before we went forwards by by getting that wrong. I think that's something that Siobhan has been on with me that you know you can't go too fast. Yeah. It's it, you have to have patience and you have to earn the right to to do it and improve your soil so that you can yeah graze differently. I think that's a theme that um, that um, has been picked up. Actually, it's that like sometimes it's baby steps. It doesn't have to be this massive revolution of doing things completely different. It is a just a bit of trying and experimenting, and then if it if it doesn't quite work or doesn't go wrong, it's a learning experience, is what we say. Um, then um, then then it's a chance to build. But it, what it does is a toe in the water, and it gets the momentum going. Um, Tom, I wonder if I can just ask you to reflect a little bit on outwintering bale grazing because you, you you're, you're doing some of that now and what that looks like for you yeah we've been we've been outwintering four or five years um, we started at home on turnips and found that we just we, we didn't have the conditions to do turnips um, it was too wet it was too clay um, that, that was an error that was a learning experience um, or trials I like trials trials you can't really have the wrong answer it might be a different answer than you expected but it's not necessarily wrong um, so what a uh, after that, we took on a block of ground, and one of the top blocks, I can remember we had some cattle, not necessarily out winting, but grazing in uh, December, January, they were just going around. And um, I went back in the field in April with a roller, and I was rolling the field, and I went over a cow poo that was three or four months old, and it went squit. And I was thinking, you know, something's massively wrong here. Nothing has broken down this, this cow poo in, in four months. Um, and we realized that it was because this soil was knackered, and it was our silage block. Um, and where it was our silage block, we were taking from it, um, which, which probably wasn't helping either. So we thought like, it was also a real free draining, it's a silt, um, silt sand loam, um, nice and high, loads of shelter, uh, probably perfect for our wintering the young stock. So th we started bale grazing, one for cheap wintering costs for the young stock, but also we were adding, we were buying in the bales, we were buying in other people's nutrients and spreading them all over our land without having to you know, pay the contractor to spread them um, and build build the fertility uh, on this ground. And I think we went from growing three cuts of silage, we were going only getting six tonnes of fresh weight in the first year and we would now be up to sort of, maybe not this year, uh, maybe not even last year, but on a, on a sensible growing year, we'd be up to 10 or 11 tonnes of fresh weight off these fields. And the, ad the addition has been the outwintering. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Debbie, could you talk about the benefits that you see of of doing regen grazing? Lots, yeah, lots of benefits. Um, so, with the dairy cows, it's kind of that resilience. I think is a lot of things. You know, I've been leaving quite early in the spring, going coming out. At sometimes it's three thousand. Um, I don't know whether everybody does plate metering and measures, but yeah, coming out at very quite high covers and kind of thinking, well, you're going to lose your quality. But that's given me that um, buffer and that resilience. One, it's carried on growing, where if I'd taken it right to the floor, when we got the heat and the drought, it would have stopped. And two, I've got that, yeah, I've got that buffer. It's like having silage in the pit. I've got grass in the field, so I can go back round, even if I haven't reached, gone back to that really high cover, and so that, that's that's really important for me that resilience um, and hopefully yeah the reducing the the costs you know if I can graze better graze more then I can less less feeding outside you know outside of that so reducing the buffer feed um, which is something I do is I buffer feed the cows that they have a, they have a buffer feed once a day when they come in for um, afternoon milking and that allows me to um, to kind of balance what stocks of grass I've got and change the um, the rest periods. So if if you know if the grass growth is slowing and I haven't got enough grass, then I can give them a bit more buffer. Um, my problem I need to probably move to my cow type because my cow type, you know, when they're giving 50 liters, they can't just milk off grass at the moment. Um, and so maybe I'm going to change that system to maybe autumn block carving or something so there, there's there's they're still evolving the system's evolving and it it will always be evolving but i think the advantage is yeah definitely outweigh the um disadvantages um i'm going to just pick up on um 
course, you, we're talking just about regen grazing, but it's very difficult to just do the grazing part and not consider like genetics and other things that I know both of you are thinking about. And one thing that you mentioned, Tom, was about the um, uh, you know taller grass, so um, contact with mouths and worms because worms only crawl so far up a stem. So it's not just about the production of the grass, but also other elements like um, like that. And, and Debbie, I wonder if you can just share your story about. Um, uh, we're talking about worms and yeah. dung beetles and overall biology. Yeah, um, so with the young stock, I've been for a couple of years doing um, rotational grazing. So um, all my kind of young stock, probably under a year old, um, in the summer they're in a big field with a lane down the middle where I have the water and then they have paddocks off the side and they get daily moved into different paddocks. Um, and I did some work working... Um, with foils group and somebody came and did some measurements for me last summer and we were comparing one group on just kind of conventional grass and one group on a herbal lay to see the effects we were hoping to see the i can't say the word arithmetic yeah <laughs> that's the one <laughs> effect of the herbal lay on um worms in them so we were um they were taking weekly dung samples to look at um the worm counts and all these young stock um and they weren't wormed all summer and i it's one of those experiments that didn't really work because both groups didn't have any worms <laughs> um <laughs> so uh, the rotational grazing was working and i didn't need the um the effects of the herbs um the other thing we were doing also is weekly looking at dung beetles um so we were you know so many pats each week had a rootle around to find out how many dung beetles there were and that was really interesting to see there was quite a lot of dung beetles there um, but we had some bad eyes and we had to fly treat the group and that hit the dung beetles by about 50% which was you know everyone talks about wormer with dung beetles not many people talk about you know the fly treatment and they are flying insects so you know <laughs> It yeah it makes sense it when makes you sense. say it like that but i don't i certainly i was like wow i yeah hadn't thought about it like that before um tom if i come back to you on um what do you what do you guys see as the benefits mm -hmm. of regen grazing for your situation can i talk about the mob grazing trial yes if that isn't a further question i'm gonna mark up the order i just won't ask it further down it's fine yeah Sorry. go 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 it's just got it's got some of the facts in it um so we're both part of uh, an innovative farmers field lab trial on mob grazing dairy cows. Might have been maybe why we were asked. And um, we we split one field on each farm is is split in half. We've chosen a 22 acre field which has got uh, a new concrete sleeper track down the middle. Historically, it's had um, all the same work done to the whole field, grazed one paddock next to the say uh, next to the other, reseeded and marked all at the same time. So we've got we've got a great starting point. Um, so the the trial is on one side we're going to do standard rotational dra grazing, um, twenty eight hundred to fifteen hundred, um, twenty one day moves, seasonal or whatever, and then on the other side it will be our interpretation of of mob grazing, amp grazing, um, and we'll do four or five grazes on one side, probably eight or nine on the other, and we're going to do we've we've already done sorry physical, chemical, and biological samples from both sides at the beginning of the trial we're all there's six six five or six of us on the trial um and we're monitoring grass growth for four years using agrinet um i think we're all pretty much also our suppliers which means we can and i'm sure the other other guys can as well but we can access milk records as well so without changing too much all of us are already collecting a lot of data so we can really see what is the difference after a four year time scale of the the mob grazing directly compared to um, rotational grazing on the same farm with the same cows um, and when we did the first set of um, data when they took the first set of samples they were actually for whatever reason it got delayed and it was about a third of the way through the first uh, first year that they took these soil samples, and I can see the lady now, <laughs> and um, I'm going to try and dictate what what Becky what Becky found, and I'm going to stare at her just so she can nod her head or shake her head. Um, but but the, the key ones for me was 
what she saw in the mob grazing side was an increase in organic matter and organic carbon in the 15 to 30 centimeter profile of the soil and she also saw an increase in the fungal to bacterial ratio in in the soil these things this is huge so when we're talking about soil biology uh, which is something I'm, I'm quite interested in um, if we can increase our I'm sure people are already aware of like increased succession, increase the bacterial to fungal ratio of our soil, we will naturally grow the later succession grasses or the wheats and barleys and things like that that we want to grow without having to reseed or, or fight the system. So in, in three or four months of this trial, if we're already seeing an increase in organic matter and an increase in fungal to bacterial ratio. I think this is this is huge. So this is this is on a dairy farm. This isn't on a beef farm where we're grazing covers and we're still we're still producing milk. And if we can carry on and see that at the end of the trial, I think we're going to have some some huge results. What's the question? How much increase? How much increase? In. So in the soil carbon, I can't remember the exact soil carbon for that. For that tr or for that field, but I can tell you for our farm. So we haven't been we've been doing as much sort of regenerative style grazing as we can on the farm um, for the last four or five years, and we've got some decent sets of data now from um, 2014 when we took over the farm. We had an average um, soil organic matter of um, five percent across the whole farm. This is ranging from like nine down to. Uh, nine to four and it basically you know you've got the farm stead and it's you've got nine percent around the buildings and it's slowly decreasing as you go away and we're part of the yo valley organic carbon regenerative soil project <laughs> where they've they've come around they've mapped our whole farm and what we found is that uh 2022 um we are now averaging um eight eight and a half percent across the farm um and to put that sort of in picture, our ALA climate check carbon score tells me that I'm emitting 1.02 kilos of carbon equivalent per litre of or per kilo of milk that we sell on farm. But the three, three and a half percent organic matter increase in the eight year period is telling me I'm sequestering um, 11 tons of carbon per hectare but my output of one kilo of milk is six tons so we're not actually emitting one kilo of carbon at all i would argue that we're um we're actually sequestering um more than we're emitting and i i would like to say that some of that has got to do with the the farm practices which is the no-till the and the regenerative grazing um moving on because we know it's not all that easy so it's not all just about the the good the good times um but we'll so we, we, we're going to tackle a few of the challenges and um i'm just going to ask both of you what what challenges you found or continue to find with the regenerative grazing i'll come come to you first debbie so challenges keeping yeah keeping the quality in front of the cows and balancing how much grass you've got there versus quality so in the spring when you've got the flush and you've got lots of grass and you've got the quality it's trying to keep as much of that grass and that quality going forward so it's how much you take out for um, silage or deferred grazing or whatever you do to to keep that quality um, and it's you know if you had a crystal ball and knew exactly what the weather was going to do it would be easy but you know you you think yeah i i'm going to be fine i can take this amount out and then it doesn't rain <laughs> and you've lost yeah and you wish you wish you hadn't silage that field <laughs> um and yeah so it's yeah it's that quality i think is the biggest thing and and then it's that balancing and uh, and it's not I was saying before, it's not like a formula. Like if you've got your cows inside and you're feeding them with a feed wagon, you can give the 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 guy on the tractor the formula and tell him to put that in the feed wagon, and the cows will get the right food. When you're doing it in a field, you've got to look at what they've eaten each day, and it's very context-driven, and it's more of an art form than a science, um, and it's that knowledge base, um, and then 
following on from that, the other challenge is kind of staff and other people and how they, you know, there's so much out there about your traditional kind of New Zealand style grazing. People find, you know, that that's wrong. You can't leave that amount of cover. You know, you're wasting the grass. You're, you know, the cows won't, the quality will go next time round. You know, there's so many different things they're saying you're doing wrong and it's quite hard to kind of, yeah, against you've got you've got to you're trying to do something that's new and different and hard, but then you're also trying to battle other people who are saying what you're doing is wrong. <laughs> so I think that's my main challenges. <laughs> and uh, that's actually a, a subject that came up in one of the previous sessions was how do you if you want to do it that's okay, but what about the team around you? So any tips there, Debbie, for how you've had successes? Um, no, if you, people can give me tips, that's fine. <laughs> um, no, I think it's, yeah, it's kind of playing on and literally showing them that it works. You know, may, uh, I haven't convinced my team completely about grazing, but things like planting maize this year after cover crops, it planted so much easier. And so I think they're convinced that cover crops are a good thing now, whereas they thought, what's a waste of time? You know, everybody else just leaves it bare. So what's the point in wasting money planting things but now they planted you know much easier drilling and they're like oh actually yeah cover crops are good so uh, i've got to find that key for grazing yet which i haven't quite found yet <laughs> maybe it will be no buffer feeding and they don't have to work you know yes kind of less work so that might be the key but uh, yeah i haven't I haven't quite cracked that one yet so we're open for suggestions when we get to the question stage um Tom, I guess the same question to you. What what challenges do you find um, with regen grazing? I think the we went on a farm walk as part of the pilot scheme. We went to a farm and they had, they call it downland, but it seemed to be up high. I, I couldn't quite work that one out. We went up to the downland and the downland was historically their poorer land and it never grew a lot. So they didn't really bother grazing with the dairy cows and they would just defer grazing with the uh, with the uh, dry, dry stock once a year, I think they were, to start with. And, um, and it, it sort of improved a bit, so they've started to graze it with the milkers. And they're doing the same thing on the main farm, but the change they're seeing on the downland, which was historically the, the poorer ground, is phenomenal because it, although it might not have been growing great grass to start with, this this downland had incredible soil health and sort of it was already really good soil being expressed badly through poor grazing management. So just the tweak in grazing management, this good soil turned into producing some amazing food. I think one of the things they were doing was buying in ryegrass red clover bales and this was because the succession was there, the health was there, the infiltration rates were there, the biology was there. These seeds were getting the expression to germinate and they were getting amazing lays uh, from this downland where, you know, well maybe on the, the main part of the farm, they weren't seeing the same results. And I think this is what we're potentially seeing on the young stock ground and some of our rotational land at home. Some of the permanent pasture is actually a lot healthier even though it was less productive, we're seeing massive results in, on the, the permanent pasture fields and we're not seeing quite such great results on the rotational land because this rotational land, um, it's not uh, our particular rotational land isn't particularly healthy. So the, the improvements we're seeing on one field from the same management aren't having the same results drew, due to the sort of historical management in that field. Do you and think that's the, the, um, the cultivation and the constant reseeding has that effect, whereas your permanent pasture has been left to yeah, definitely. get better? Like they, they, someone was telling me about the, the, the dust bowls in the 30s, and there's other dust bowls now. The difference between the dust bowls in the 30s and the dust bowls now, the dust bowls in the 30s had, were darker brown because there was more soil carbon. And I think those, you know, this is the difference. My my carbon has been cultivated out. We've turned that into pasture and, and different things. So it's putting our dairy ground on a knife edge. So by putting that soil on that poor condition, we're going from, from wet to dry, uh, active to inactive pretty quickly. So the the grass is naturally under stress. So if we if we get it wrong with the, the grazing we can we can hit milk, which isn't perfect. 
<laughs> less, than, less than perfect. Uh, it's interesting that, isn't it? The the latent seed bed that, that we don't get taught about necessarily, about the seeds that exist there in the in the ground, which when managed in a different way express themselves, and that's been um, probably one of the most fascinating things for me on 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 all of um, all of this journey. Um, we're going to move on to some questions um, and I I in a second, but just a quick fire before we do that, just to kind of round up this section. Um, I'll go to Debbie first and then Tom, just a, a, a real quick fire top tips for getting started. Um, start with kind of young stock or yeah, dry stock rather than the cows. You know, the cows are the tricky bit and well, you do want the good growth rates on your young stock and things like that, but if you get it wrong with the cows, you lose milk and then you lose money. So learn how to do different grazing on kind of the younger stock, I would say. Tom. I think if you've got if you've got some really good, healthy soil, you're, you're fairly well good to go s straight on the dairy herd, but only if you have that good, healthy soil. If you've got some pretty unhealthy soil, start with a massive like 120, 180 day rest and graze some dry stock or some beefers that maybe you don't mind hitting growth rates for a week. Give it a massive reset and then start with the sort of Siobhan Griffin training of slowly increase. Um, one of the great things I think with the the more regenerative style grazing is is you're not constantly um, hitting residuals. So with our cows we have to walk up, we have to walk a kilometre and a half to paddocks. And if we get the grazing wrong, we're using a lot of energy to get there. And if we underfeed the cows on our sort of grazing out style of uh, rotational grazing, we can hit milk this way. So one of the massive, uh, I think, positives you can take is if you're not having to hit a residual of 1,500, you've raised it to 2,000, your fence isn't in quite the right place, um, you have a buffer of, of food there. So maybe start on some further away paddocks also. Okay, brilliant. Um, we will. Uh, anybody got any questions? We've got the mic over here. So, um, if yeah, we'll go for this gentleman right in front of you. Keep it, keep it simple for starting. Hi, yeah. Um, thanks. Really interesting. Really interesting. Thank you both. Um, there's a bit of talk about um, does regenerative need certification? You know, to give it a label, as it were. Do you think re your style of grazing warrants or needs a uh, premium of a conventional, or is it such good farming that you don't need any extra money for it? I mean, everybody wants extra money, <laughs> but I think I'd like a premium, but um, I don't think I'm going to get one. So um, I think if you get it right, it should it should pay for itself, and should be a. But ideally, we'd like a premium for it. <laughs> I would like to argue that if we get this right, if we can say we start with the soils, we improve the soils, we've got better cycling soils, producing better quality pasture. But better quality pasture is feeding a healthier animal and that healthier animal is producing a higher quality product, surely that higher quality product shouldn't be valued by weight, but on nutrient density. So if, and only if, we are increasing nutrient density, so theoretically you could reduce intake, so you don't have to buy as much, maybe that could demand a premium. Um, oh crikey, now I get a bit overwhelmed. Um, we're over, over here, I think that's the next hand I saw go up. Uh, Stephen Temple, farming in North Norfolk. Uh, we're beset by droughts, our rainfall is fairly low, so we're looking to grow deeper rooted herbal lays for our grazing, for, for, our, for our milkers. Have you, you haven't mentioned herbal lays for, graze, for, for milking cows. Is that because it's too difficult? I've not been using them for milking cows yet, so have you, Tom? We're we're just starting to get going. I'm not an expert on uh, I'm not an expert on herbal lays, um, but we're, we're we're starting. We started with all ryegrass, and we weren't in a position where we could rip it all up. Uh, we're putting in a 15-way mix. Uh, we started with like a four or five. We've gone up to we went up to a seven last year. I'm pretty convinced um, it's the way forward. Um, so we've put in a 15 a 15-way mix this year. I don't know if you can guess where that came from. Um, and we're really keen on this deeper rooting stuff because we're, we're seeing the same droughts as you are. And not just the deeper roots, but um, another learning from Siobhan is the complete vegetative stage. 
So if you've got uh, your herbs or your legumes or some of the different grasses, they are their leaf from top to bottom, whereas the ryegrass in drought conditions just goes, you know, goes straight ahead, and you've got lower quality. So yeah, we would be we're we're trying it, but not an expert yet. I think uh, anecdotally, I think the herbal lays prefer a longer rest period. You're less likely to lose some of those um, legumes and herbs, so having a longer rest period. So, but we'll see. Yeah, um, yeah. I think there was just behind. There's another hand there, and then there was one over here. I think. Was yeah. Hi, um, Jim Lather, farmer in Cumbria, in a Arla supplier. Um, obviously, the regenerative focus. Uh, around soil health and soil organic carbon is, is great. Do you think there's any room in the dairy industry to start looking at biodiversity indices and looking at actually take making dairy farming um, seriously nature positive? Yes. <laughs> I think, yeah, especially if you can have, um, it's not just the diversity, you're not just talking about hedgerows and trees, you know, if you've got that diversity, yeah, yeah, you got curlews. Yeah, I had one nest maybe on my farm this year, so, <laughs> but not on dairy grazing. Um, th yeah, so I think the whole diversity in the pasture and is really, really important. And you know, it's not just thinking about biodiversity on the edges of fields. I think the biodiversity throughout the fields is you know really important. And I think this type of grazing fits with that. Yeah, hundred percent. I always look back to the Sustainable Food Trust, the uh, Feeding Britain report, um, and use the argument of land sparing against land sharing. Um, and I would definitely argue for land sharing. And also, it, it talks a lot about um, farming for soil types. So we, and hopefully, this is where we will be uh, in our farming system. Our Grade One and Grade Two land will be our arable land. Our Grade Two and Three, Three A land, will be our dairy land. And our grade four land, we've got triple SIs, SNCIs, and sort of vast lowland uh, lowland banks. Uh, the grade four sort of stuff. This will be for our Anguses and our dry cows, and maybe the the specific dairy ground won't be the most amazing stuff, but it will be in a rotation, um, surrounded by the, the SSIs, and all these soil types will be farmed in a way that sort of fits that to build the bigger picture of environment, food, um, and farming together. Uh, yeah, the gentleman there stood up. Yeah, that was the next person. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was just in a, um, a dairy farm in Scotland, and they were saying they'd get penalised for producing a lot of milk in spring, and they do a spring calving. And so uh, I think it was Arla who's doing that. They, they, you pay, get paid a lot less for, for working with nature. Does that actually actively work against... Uh, the principles of uh, re regen in dairy. We're we're spring carving, and um, we would argue that our cost of production for being spring carvers um, would offset any penalties that we would get for spring milk. So I wouldn't be worried about about that on on my farm personally. I'm probably a pretty level profile, so I'm not really influenced that much by the yeah the, the penalisation of um, spring milk. Um, but I think you've got to factor in it's a whole whole business. So although you think you, you should be paid for producing milk in the best time of the year, you've still got to that got to be processed and and people got to buy it. So. Um, it seems fair that you get paid depending on when you produce it. Okay, any other? Um, we've got one here and then we'll go over to that one over there. Oh, you're there. Oh, sorry. Um, hi, Tom. Um, Peter Wasnidge from Devon. Um, you talked about the amount of carbon you've increased in the top 15 centimetres of your soil. Um, obviously, you're now starting to move to some herbal lays as well. And there's a huge amount of research up there to say that things like maize crops and fodder beet crops grown in the right um, rotations can be putting down carbon as, as low as a metre. Um, have you got any plans to be trying to um, do deeper soil profiling and, and try and get you know, the full picture rather than just the top 15 centimetre zone? 
Yeah, no, definitely. The with the Yo Valley Carbon Carbon Farming Toolkit project. <laughs> they keep changing the name, Becky. <laughs> they um they they've gone down to fifty centimeters, but our original soil samples were only the naught to fifteen. So we've we've now got data moving forward to s to show uh, what we're doing to fifty centimeters, and it is the with the Becky seeing I and you can nod or, or shake. I the the uh, the herbal lays and the mob grazing. It th they're seeing the big difference is the fifteen to thirty centimeter soil depth. That's where they're seeing the big changes. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I'll be growing maize just because it doesn't really fit our system, but the on the arable ground, tillage, radish, um, and sunflowers, and everything in the middle in the um, cover crops would definitely be something we'll be looking at. Do you want, do you want to add anything, Debbie? Or no, you're fine. Okay, next question. Yeah, it's here. Hello, uh, Luke down from East Sussex. I've, I milk jerseys, and anyone knows jerseys, they're a bloody fussy bunch. And I've done mob grazing for years, done beef, done stuff with beef cattle with young stock, outwintering young stock, following on with sheep and then poultry. So regenerative grazing and mob grazing, stuff I've done for a while. And what I was, I was like, oh, someone's finally going to do a talk on regenerative dairy grazing because we know that it's hard to really nail mob grazing with dairy. What I find is I've got grass up to my shoulders, got grass up to my waist, which is great. When there's droughts, all my neighbours around me were feeding their winter bales last year, and I had grass coming out my ears. And it's hard to really manage that balance of anyone that's trying it is that when, like I said, when the grass goes too mature, I'm really trying to find this balance of not losing cow condition, maintaining milk yield. But I don't want any, even a good dairy farm I look at, their grass is only that. And I find that's like optimum conditions for, for a milker, to be fair, but... It pains me when I've only got grass that's 10, 15 centimetres tall. When I've got grass up to my shoulder, the cows go through. So I'm trying to find a way of, you know, the jerseys won't clear it up properly, and I find it hard. You, you don't want to push them too hard. So I'm trying to find a way of, do I put beef in to start with to knock some of that down? And then follow in with the milkers, you know, when it's like mid-height, and then sheep to clear up behind them. So it's uh, I'm trying to find that weird balance. I think Siobhan, when we've been doing the training, she was saying don't let it get to that shoulder height and put your um, your your young stock to do that mob grazing and really hammer it earlier and then when it regrows from that then put your cows in so it's kind of keeping your kind of delaying your cows grazing by using the young stock to kind of put yeah yeah You better just fly around your farm, I think. Just just get it done. Get that first graze and then first bites done. And then be a bit more tactical in a second. Can you just yeah. put the mic up to your mouth? Oh, <laughs> sorry. I was <laughs> thought everyone could hear me. <laughs> so, yeah, like, um, I think, yeah, that's the case. I what I'm going to have to do is bring that sword down initially in the springtime. Knock back that mature stuff. And I found I do lays as well. And so you, I think you were saying you do seven years rotation or something with lays. I find... So I love permanent pasture. Obviously, they're a lot more resilient. You can batter them a bit harder. They'll always bounce back. The lays, you have to be a bit more delicate with, especially in that first year of establishment. But I find the lays, there's a lot more biodiversity and broadleaf stuff in there initially. But I find the quality definitely drops after about four years. Hence, then a re-establishment needs to happen where the permanent pasture is a lot better. So basically, fly around the farm as quick as possible, I think, is my next bout next year. Yeah, I think that's something we... Yeah. It was hard to explain everything that Siobhan's been teaching us in this. Is it called next level grazing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's yeah that that initial. I think she calls it flash grazing. That first round and just going, going round and taking a bite after everything. Um, and then when when you're coming back round, it's then you're thinking about. Yeah, but then yeah, if you've got if you still got lots of grass, rather than letting it go to mature, graze it before it gets too mature with the young stock, so that you kind of defer that grazing back a bit yeah and with the mobbing it, it i think there's there's sort of three levels of grazing you've got mob grazing bad grazing and rotational grazing and it's really easy to do the bad grazing 
with the mob grazing, especially with ryegrass, and even Siobhan says it's really hard because the stems don't break very easily. And what you're looking for is you need the intensity of grazing. And I think we came up to Groundswell when um, we called it Gabe Swell and Gabe Brown and this lot up here. And he was saying even like the the shape of the paddock will change the way they'll, they will they can graze it out. A long, thin paddock is better than a, um, a square paddock. And if you haven't got the density in that paddock to actually take that mother plant and snap it off so the tillers are what's coming through and you're using the mother plant to either set seed or to add carbon and we've had it before where you're like you're saying it's gone too far ahead you need to keep the round going so you're just grazing it you're basically just grazing it, it, it badly and you end up losing milk because you haven't you haven't trampled it enough so that you've got the, the green tillers coming through and you've let it go too far so you're grazing too much lignified material and cows don't cows don't milk off that can i can i just ask a quick question on that D are you are both of you considering the role of ryegrass in your grazing system are you making any changes less more anything else because of the challenges it has i said pretty much all of my grass is permanent pasture there is some ryegrass in there but there's a whole mixture but i want to get more um herbs and other species in there but it's just trying um haven't worked out yet how to get that overseed because the permanent pasture is so dominant you try and put new things in and it doesn't cope i know tom's been working on doing some overseeding um uh, it's a really hard one our, our business works at the moment it, it is a business that stands on its own two feet we're not we're not like necessarily struggling and that is from a rye grass so i don't, I don't want to sit up here and bash rye grass because it's it's it sort of worked it's a bit like the you know the agrochemical farming system it's not that we're all sit here starving and we need to change what we're doing i think what we're trying to do is tweak the system so rather than just having ryegrass clover lays we're taking our slightly tired lays and stitching in um this 15-way mix into that um ryegrass lay i think i would be happy with 30 to 40 percent of my lays still being ryegrass at this point uh, i know there are people that there with no ryegrass in their lays and they're getting on really well but I, d I don't think i'm confident enough at this point to be like this is the enemy i don't want you anymore nothing's the enemy it's all just a diversity um next question oh we're already prepped here we go it's uh, Katri from Estonia. And my uh, simple question is that uh, for uh, dairy grazing, how much should there be uh, legumes uh, in the mixture? And how are they uh, staying in this mixture? I think that's one for you, Claire. <laughs> this is not the place that I want to start being um, a, um, a, 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 a lay. There's best be other people much much more expert than me. I think um, it, it w I'm going to give an answer that won't answer your question, I'm afraid, which it depends on the context and what you're doing, what you're trying to achieve, uh, the longevity that you want to have from the lay, what else you're planting with it and what, what, what's missing. And I think the one thing that um, you know comes out of all of this is diversity is key and everybody's mix of diversity will be different. So um, there are, I basically don't know the answer <laughs> to what the optimum will be. And uh, th there's loads of people here that will. Um, uh, yeah, but I think just um, um, a uh, it's no one thing, a, a, a mixture of uh, a number of different things will be the answer. Another, oh, we got one over here, yeah. Hello, um, I'm over here from Tasmania. One, one of the things that we're considering doing with our, we, we milk a thousand jerseys as well, fickle girls, um, is actually shifting our phenotype gradually to actually a, a, a cow that will produce on a more recovered grass. Is that something that's been done over here in any? I think this is a really great uh, topic of um, conversation in itself. Um, I, we looked at um, one of the key performance indicators on our, like going back to the sort of core Kiwi system would be kilos of milk solids per kilo of live weight. And I think that works really well if you've got a 12 and a half ME ryegrass plant that's 100% leaf fed with nitrogen and you can have a very efficient small cow eating that style of grass but when you go to 
the, the way we're trying to do it, we've moved away from the, the Kiwi genetics and gone to the Irish genetics. We've gone from a slightly bigger framed animal and we're looking for intake capacity rather than um, capacity of um, or that one-to-one -one ratio because I don't think that that one-to-one -one ratio is obviously very efficient when talking about milk solids to weight, but water quality, soil erosion and all those other things, it's not, it's not a circular system that works. So we would be looking at a slightly bigger cow producing slightly less milk. We, we would be happy with 80-85% kilos of milk solids um, to 85% uh, uh, milk solids to live weight ratio. Uh, I, I think it's a really good point. Yes, similarly, I, I'm probably a slightly bigger cow with the Montbelliard and the Brown Swiss Crosses um, and originally doing that and I'm still doing that for beef calf value because we take all the calves through to beef so I like having that bigger um, bigger calf but I think the capacity of some of these bigger cows to eat more forage and therefore get more out of what they're grazing and they don't need it quite so high quality is, is quite important and I've not got any figures on it but that's my kind of feeling and that's why I've kind of staying with those kind of cows right I think we do one more question um, before the end if anyone has a burning one or we could wrap up early and everyone could go to the toilet and the bar and that would also be a bonus <laughs> perfect look at that perfect timing um, well um, I'm sure you'll join me in thanking Debbie and Tom today uh,